He did not know about the divine preeminence of the profit motive. He did not know that a moral decision had been taken that market forces must come before the safety of the earth, no matter what the cost. Ben Elton, Stark. This is the end, and once again, I'm your host, the pop mythologist. Today's episode is another interview, and I want to introduce the guest with a personal story. My own journey towards collapse awareness began not that long ago, actually, in 2020. Though, given how obsessed I've become about this topic, I feel like in just a couple of years, I've made up for lost time. But at first, it started simply as an increasing concern for what felt like the breakdown of American democracy. And in an effort to better understand what was going on and all the different factors that were causing it, I embarked on a personal reading project of just trying to read as many books about the state of our democracy as I could, where we were at, what brought us here, and where we were going if things continued to get worse and if we didn't take measures to fix things. During this time, I read some really good books, but my favorite out of all of the ones that I read was a book called Last Chance to Save American Democracy by Haven Scott McBearish. It was because of the emphasis on solutions and on action and on things that individual citizens could do, which I felt was lacking in some of the other books that I had read. And not only did it offer solutions, it did so step-by-step in such a clear, well-organized, and well-argued way that I actually ended up reaching out to the author. And I wrote, you know, like, hey, you don't know me, but I just want to say how amazing your book was. And I wrote some other things like that. And I didn't expect him to write back, but he actually did. And so we started a correspondence and kind of got to sharing aspect of each other's story and became friends. And I felt so passionate about the message of his book that for a while I helped him try to get the word out about it. You know, one of the things that we did was uh, we contacted various representatives in Congress as well as specific journalists and just to, you know, try to get the word out about it, to get more people reading and talking about it. And in the case of Congress people, we sent books to those in Congress that we felt would either be sympathetic and receptive to the message and to the proposals and solutions, or just people who just really needed to read it, assuming, uh, of course, that they even cared about the state of our democracy to begin with, which is an open question, I think. And two examples of the latter were Senators Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, and we literally sent boxfuls of Haven's book to the offices and staffers of these two senators. And I mean, considering who they are and considering the message of the book and considering uh, the positions of these senators, you could almost see what we did as a kind of a form of positive trolling (laughs) in a way, you know? So um, anyway, I, I became a friend of Haven in addition to being a fan. And as we got to know each other, we learned that we had also a mutual interest in the topic of collapse. And he recommended that I read a dystopian novel called Stark by Ben Elton, whom I had previously never heard of. And Haven mentioned that it was one of his favorite novels and that it was about collapse. And so I did read it and I loved it. And so when I started this podcast, I knew that I would eventually want to bring Haven on as a guest to talk about Stark and also talk about his own book and his work. And so I was finally able to interview him. And before we get to the interview, I just wanted to quickly read a short bio for Haven. So Haven Scott McFarish is the founder and director of the nonprofit organizations Common Sense Democracy and Five Journeys. He has been a community organizer, a strategist for local political campaigns, a union leader, and the founder of one of the most successful immigration law firms in Los Angeles. He is a former congressional candidate a frequent political commentator on both television and on various podcasts, such as this one, and now he is a regenerative farmer. 
His second book, Last Chance to Save American Democracy, was published just weeks before the 2020 election. So that's his bio, and during the interview, we talked about the novel Stark, which, as mentioned, is a dystopian novel about ecological collapse, and we talked about his book as well, and these two books are great complements to each other, by the way. And we talked about the work that he's currently doing to fight collapse or prepare for collapse by helping to create local community resilience and eventually bring about a rejuvenation of democracy through both inner and outer transformation, both personally and societally. And because we talked about issues that both he and I are most passionate about right now, namely collapse and preparing for collapse through local community resilience and saving democracy, this interview ended up being quite longer than usual for this podcast. But I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed conducting it. And so without further ado, here is my interview with Haven Scott McVarish. Okay, let's do this. Haven Scott McFerrish, thank you very much for being here today. I will be introducing you in a separately recorded introduction for this episode. And I'll also introduce the novel we're going to talk about today called Stark. So to save time, let's just jump right into the questions. In a private conversation, you once told me that many years ago, this book made you an activist. So can you start by telling us, first of all, why you like this book so much? And specifically, what was it about the book that made you want to be an activist? Yeah, so I think I read the book in 1990. Uh, at the time, it was a bestseller in the British Commonwealth, sold over a million copies. And I was living in New Zealand, Aotearoa at the time, for two years. So I probably got it at its peak. It was before the TV miniseries occurred. And it really spoke to me. I had never seen the dangers to the world and people's inaction and blasé uh, spirit on addressing those dangers in such a succinct manner. And, you know, we're not talking Rachel Carson's Silent Spring manner. We are talking a hilarious novel by Britain's top comedic writer at the time. He wrote on some series called Black Adder and a few others that anybody who grew up in England, New Zealand, Australia, or other places uh, during the 80s and 90s would have known and loved. And so it was just a very accessible book. And I think that was a really strong approach because even though ultimately I think the book is mostly sad and has a tragic ending. It is nevertheless, it keeps your spirits high because in any moment of crisis, a very funny wisecrack will occur or something unexpected that will make you want to read and reread because the hapless heroes of the story are able to pull one over on the man, so to speak. And so I, I think it was both enlightening and somewhat empowering. And that's very uncommon in our literature on uh, climate change or, you know, the end of democracy or anything like that. And in fact, that in some part inspired my approach in my book as well uh, to make kind of let my sarcasm and irony and little snippets of humor um, be interspersed with what was ultimately probably a pretty dark message, my book. Yeah, in your book, Last Chance to Save American Democracy, we're going to be coming back to that in a minute. And I also want to circle back to the humor that you mentioned, because I really want to stress to listeners just how hilarious this novel is. But first, I just want to ask something, which is this book was published in 1989. And while I was reading it, I, I, like, I just couldn't believe how accurately it, <laughs> yeah. it depicts Sorry. and predicts. 30 years later, yep. Yeah, what's Absolutely. going on today uh, yeah. with regards to things like climate change, ecological collapse, and just the amount of political power that the wealthy have. And other than the absence of certain kinds of technology in the story, such as smartphones, it doesn't feel outdated at all. You know, it could have no. been very well been written today. And, yeah. you know, there are certain classic dystopian novels that are very well known, such as Fahrenheit 451 and The Handmaid's Tale, which is very popular nowadays, given all the things going on with reproductive rights. And given how good this book is, why do you think it isn't more 
it isn't better known. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, I think in part, well, first, let me address why it's so accurate. You know, Ben Elton, as far as I know, is not a climate scientist. Uh, he doesn't, I would guess, have any science background. But the fact that literally 34, 35 years later, pretty much every single thing he has said has transpired just shows you that we knew all of this stuff in the 80s and he was just paying attention. And, you know, a comedy writer paying attention to science, putting it in his book is not that he is prescient. It's just that he listened to the science. And the scientists were correct in their projections. And in some ways, p- perhaps they were even a little subdued um, uh, with how bad things were happening. Although, I don't know. I think his his picture is pretty accurate. Why is it not more popular? Well, as opposed to books like The Handmaiden's Tale, Fahrenheit 451, where you have the, the evil presence in those books are a powerful government, and you could even say a powerful right-wing government. So immediately you have, uh, you're not blaming corporations for one. You are not blaming the rich and powerful for one. It's almost like you're blaming the Soviet Union or, you know, a Reagan um, administration on steroids, which I guess would be called Trump administration. And so you've got a whole group of people who are automatically opposed to the, this enemy, but you don't have corporate America or global corporations being fingered. Ben Elton's book doesn't have that exact formula. He, in fact, is fingering the global corporations. And who controls the books? Who controls the media coverage of books like this? Uh, when uh, Don't Look Up came out uh, a year or so ago, you know, it was I don't want to say a ripoff, but it had so many elements of Ben Elton Stark that I almost I I did look in the credits to see if they were going to credit him. And the fact that they didn't just kind of shows me that in the last 30 years, there has not been any type of collective awakening by corporations and they still suppress things. Now, of course, with so many channels, you can get pretty much any story told. But even that book uh, or that movie is pretty much already faded out of our consciousness. We, people talked about it for three weeks, maybe four, and now it's done. And in 10 years, I don't think anybody's going to remember Don't Look Up. Plus, it was a little bit fanciful. It was about a meteorite, so that was not an evil corporation causing it. It was just an evil corporation who stopped us from you know, you know the solution. So I think Stark just picked the wrong enemies. When you go after global corporations, which is what he's going after, you know, good luck getting the word out. Right. No, I think that's an amazing analysis, actually. And uh, you partially already answered my next question, which was going to be about Don't Look Up. And and yes, it's amazing the similarities between Stark and Don't Look Up. And I was also wondering, as I was watching Don't Look Up, like, man, did someone, <laughs> did they read Stark? You know, I'm sure they did. I mean, it was a, it was a bestseller uh, worldwide briefly, but not in the U.S. The U.S. It was almost not published in the U.S. Um, I, all the copies I've ever had have been uh, British or uh, New Zealand or Australian um, imprints. And um, so, yeah, I don't know if it ever really hit our shores and really, you know, even though it's a global corporations that are blamed just as much, you know, Japanese corporations as Saudi corporations and American, at the end of the day, I think it really was a direct attack on American corporations specifically. And so no surprise that this book didn't make it in the U.S. Yeah. And this, this isn't a question, but I really just did want to comment on the humor in the book. So I got to be honest, as much as I love the book, it kind of took me a while to get into it. So I kind of mm-hmm. want to stress to the audience, you know, if you if you decide to read this, stick with it, even if it feels like it's kind of slow at first, because it gets when it once it starts getting good, it's really good. And the other thing that I struggled with at first was that I tend to like my dystopian stories to be serious. <laughs> and this one was, you know, very humorous. But then I'm, you know, like after a while, 
at like at first it was a little bit annoying and then it just started becoming so genuinely laugh out loud funny in a yeah. way that felt true to the simultaneous dark elements like it was dark humor right but it was genuinely hilarious yes just like don't look up and so i feel like for folks who like to don't look up i really really recommend stark and i and i'm pretty sure haven you would recommend it to them as well yeah a a anybody who's ever i would have brought in that audience to anybody who's ever appreciated any british movie <laughs> or TV series, because this is written at a time, really kind of the, the peak of Britain's independence from American media. The BBC One, BBC Two, a few of the other private channels they had, they were, were dominating the airways in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. You couldn't find American television in the 80s and, and early 90s in those countries. And so they really had their heyday. And uh, so for those of us who like that, you know, it's kind of right after Monty Python, then you're going to love this book. If you're not a fan of British humor, you would still enjoy this if you really love to read books about collapse and, you know, democracy ending and the rich and powerful getting richer and more powerful. But you know, uh, hesitate because they're all too depressing. This is a really good medium because everything he wrote not only has come true, but his analysis at the foundation of the character's motives, the plot is dead on. I mean, it's as true in 89 as it is today. And frankly, it's as true 2000 years ago. Since we have had city states, since we have had the beginnings of empires, the exact same motives have occurred for five, six, seven thousand years now. And it was as much true in 89 as it was in the Assyrian Empire 5,000 years ago as it is in 2022 GOP politics and corporations. And it's just all about the consolidation of wealth and power without any regard for humanity or the earth. Yeah, and that was one of the major themes of Jared Diamond's book, Collapsed, in that this has essentially been happening since all these ancient empires. And yeah. speaking of the end of democracy, let's now discuss some of the themes in the book as it relates to your own book, Last Chance to Save American Democracy, which was published in 2020. And one of the things that your book discusses is the systematic and comprehensive way that the GOP the Republican Party, has consciously worked to undermine our democratic processes and create the system that is now very much about minority rule. And I know that there are those who would argue that the U.S. has never really been a true democracy, but how would you explain to the audience how the GOP has created this undemocratic system or rather undermined democracy? When did they do it and why did they do it? Yeah, not to parse uh, words uh, too much, but it's not so much the GOP or the Republican Party as the people that have captured the GOP and the Republican Party. And, you know, it, it, at this point, it's kind of hard to distinguish. But on the whole, probably most state legislators um, who are in the Republican Party really have no idea what their party really is about. And you can kind of see that in just the hilarious clips on late night television that are constantly showing what purports to be the hypocrisy of Republicans. One minute, you know, being for global trade and the next minute being protectionist to the nth degree. And, you know, one minute saying we should never uh, bow down to the Saudi Arabian prince. And then the next minute cheering on Donald Trump for making so much money on the Saudi Arabian golf tournament. You know, it so it is, I think hidden from most Republicans what the Republican Party is really doing, because ultimately it is not some type of collective decision. Rather, it is a happening in a sense behind the scenes by the strategists, if you will, not the strategists of the Republican Party, but the strategists of the world's and our country's wealthiest and most powerful people who have decided that the best way for them to protect their interests 
in the past have been to, in a sense, kind of control both parties through through various means, whether it's media attention, whether it's campaign contributions, et cetera, et cetera, um, but now are a little bit more focused on the Republican Party because I think they have seen and understood a path to a forever party in power. They have found a way to basically make the Republicans obtain power and stay in power for what they hope will be a thousand years or at least their lifetime and probably will be about 15 or 20 years realistically before it just kind of implodes on them. But ultimately, it is not the Republican Party. So now what am I talking about? What I'm talking about is that Throughout human history, there have always been leaders um, who have wanted to consolidate wealth and power into their hands, and they have to do so with the support of the most powerful in their you know, nation, country, city, state, religion, whatever. And so thus you have like in Russia, what we call the oligarchs, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know why we're using that word uh, to describe as if it's something new and distinct to Russia. Every country in the history of the world has had that, except for the ones that are most democratic, and that's mostly Scandinavian countries and a few other countries like Costa Rica and a few others, where you don't have the, as much of an elite making the decisions. But on the whole, you know, 99% of humanity has not lived under democracy. And we kind of forget that. We think, wow, you know, we live under democracy. Everyone lives under democracy. And and well, sure, a few people don't, but on the whole, you know, we are just accustomed to the idea that democracy rules the day. Well, over the course of five, six, seven thousand years of civilization, democracy has not ruled the day. That's why what happened in 1776 was so important and um, so different and so uh, unique. And so the question of how long have we been a democracy, you know, you could argue different points of view on that. But I think mostly since 1965 and the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act, that's when we became our greatest democracy, the most amount of people being able to vote. But ultimately, we have a situation where the richest and most powerful who want to live like princes and princesses of old, where they have wealth beyond your imagination. And anybody who doesn't think that's true is just not paying attention whatsoever when you see billionaires and try to grasp just how much money that really is. They are living like the princes and princesses of old, and they want to keep accumulating that money and that wealth and that power. And so how do you do that? Well, the very first thing you have to do is attack the government's ability to levy taxes on you. So you don't pay your fair share. And, and corporations are also doing that, which is why most of the major corporations in the um, uh, stock market on Wall Street don't pay taxes. They literally do not pay any income tax because they have hired buildings full of lobbyists and accountants and attorneys who uh, and political operatives who have helped create a system over decades that have enabled them to make sure that they have as many tax breaks as possible. Most of them we don't even understand. I mean, even if you gave a summary of all the tax breaks, we wouldn't understand what most of them are. They are so obscure, but they allow corporations and rich individuals who are able to take advantage of them to constantly find ways to shelter their money from taxes. And I could literally spend the next hour giving you examples, but if you don't understand that going into this interview, then you probably won't accept that the wealthy um, are taxed at a much lower rate than us. And, you know, uh, Buffett pointed that out, that he pays less percentage of tax than his secretary. And so they have been able to do that. It's not a conspiracy. It's just a motive. Um, and then there's an agreement. And the agreement is mostly behind closed doors. And they use that agreement to basically chart a path starting in 2008 when it really accelerated after Obama got elected. And it was, in fact, in reaction to Obama getting elected. More specifically, it was in reaction to a few taxes that the Democratic 
Congress of 2009 and 2010 passed. Uh, if you remember, uh, George Bush had given away billions of dollars in taxes and tax breaks to the wealthiest people, which is one of the reasons our uh, economy absolutely crashed in 2007, 2008. And what he was able to do was uh, stop uh, the inheritance tax and uh, lower the um, highest amount of taxes that people would pay and corporations. And Obama started to, Obama and the Democratic Congress started to restore that. So in reaction, the wealthiest, some of the wealthiest people like the Betsy DeVos's of the world, the Koch brothers, uh, funded a nonprofit called Citizens United. And that nonprofit, who had been engaged in unsuccessful litigation for 15 years on this exact issue of campaign finance, was finally able to be successful the, with the very much Republican Supreme Court. And that just changed everything. So once the Republicans were able to, uh, not the Republicans, once the wealthiest were able to give unlimited and untraceable amounts of money in the 2010 election, they were able to flip very safe Democratic uh, states at the time, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, um, Ohio was kind of a more of a purple state, of course. Um, even Iowa was, was a purple state. They were able to flip these states in one election cycle by focusing on just a certain, a very small percentage of the legislative seats and go from uh, Democrats winning 52 to 48 percent to Republicans winning 52 to 48. But they were able to get that in enough seats by um, outspending uh, Democrats 20 to 1 not the campaigns of the actual Republican candidates, but the dark money that for the first time had no off switch, thank you to the Supreme Court and the Citizens United decision. And so in 2010, they got these super majorities. And those super majorities then, knowing they would never last, were able to do this extreme computer-assisted gerrymandering, pass these voter suppression laws and pump money into this right-wing media ecosphere that used to only be Fox News. And now Fox News is the most rational of this giant media ecos uh, right-wing ecosphere. And that is how they were able to, in essence, take over our democracy. So to the extent that you see places like North Carolina, which has majority votes for Democrats for Congress and legislature, but six, uh, 13 out of the 16 congressmen are Republicans, even though 53, 54, 55 percent of the votes in congressional races go to Democrats. And so that is where we have the ending of democracy. And the only thing that saved us was Donald Trump, because Donald Trump was not what the elite wanted. They wanted a Jeb Bush. They wanted somebody who would be a, you know, a happy face. Um, uh, another, in essence, George Bush, who just a kindly, somewhat kindly man who could be easily controlled and would go along with the game. And instead, they got this Tasmanian devil who, you know, was a absolute enemy to Democrats, but often an enemy to Republicans and sometimes an enemy to poor people and sometimes an enemy to rich people all over the map. And it was only because of Trump winning in 2016 that Democrats were able to successfully gain uh, the House in 2018 and the White House and the Senate in 2020. But that those systematic advantages that the Republicans now have, the gerrymandering, the unlimited and untraceable money, the voter suppression, the crazy um, upside down world of their right wing media, so well funded, all those advantages stay the same. And uh, so my prediction was that the next two election cycles, you would finally see a rational Republican, uh, semi-rational, I should say, someone like a DeSantis coming and winning the election and then the Democrats never having a shot again. Not because they're not in the majority, they are in the majority, but because the system is so rigged to the advantage of the Republicans who are controlled ultimately by their funders who are looking for the tax break so that they can increase their wealth and uh, power. And uh, that will it'll take a generation a political generation or two 
15, 20 years before the Democrats get in back into power. And that will only be because of the autocratic system always implodes because you don't reward talent, you don't reward skill, you don't reward ideas, you reward sycophants, you reward people who are loyal to you, no matter their lack of competence. And you see that throughout Trump's regime of four years, where he's surrounded by just idiots and knaves and fools. And it is because that is what autocrats need around them. But someone like a um, DeSantis will have a higher quality of people around him in the beginning. And, uh, but within, uh, you know, 10, 12 years, presuming they haven't completely changed the constitution, which they are going to do. And I wrote about in the book, how and when that the Democrats should be able to finally get back in power. Although, uh, you know, Democrats are about as ineffectual in opposition as you can find. Did that answer your question? Yes, very (laughs) comprehensively. Thank you very much. But I just want to quickly clarify for the listeners that you are obviously no lover of Trump. You have relentlessly criticized him in your in in your book, in your TV appearances, in your podcast, uh, the Daily Trump that you used to do. So, you know, you you clearly (laughs) you are not a lover of Trump, but you have kind of pointed out certain interesting nuances in which in this really weird way. He has kind of accidentally, not like intentionally, because he doesn't know what, know what, he, what he's doing, but That's accidentally right. slowed down some of the plans by the more, as you call it, the semi-rational branch of the, the GOP. And, and, and I found that very interesting. Like as despicable yeah. a figure as he clearly is, he has done some accidentally, I don't know, semi-beneficial things in, in the sense That's of right. accidentally slowing down some of the, the yeah. GOP plans. He plan. has... He has slowed down the takeover of our government much more than Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, or Joe Biden. They are about as ineffectual an opposition as you can find, all three of those individuals, who, by the way, I agree with their politics in probably 98% of the time, and I probably would like them if I knew them personally, but as an opposition, they are just... Oh, they are so sad. And the very fact that Nancy Pelosi has remained the leader of the uh, House uh, Democrats after losing the election in 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, I think actually she won one of those, but still lost a lot of seats, just shows you that the Democrats really uh, have don't care about the democracy itself. Because if you cared about democracy, you would want to win. And the only reason we are winning right now is that Donald Trump keeps screwing things up. We would have never gotten the Senate unless he torpedoed the Georgia uh, races um, in January of 2020. Or was it 2021? (laughs) It seems like so long ago. Uh, I think it's probably, yeah, it was 2021. The election was 2020. But the Georgia race, if you remember, the runoffs occurred in January of 2021, and he was a nightmare in the Republican caucus and literally encouraged people not to vote, saying that their vote would be not counted and it would be unfair. And it was basically a temper tantrum that Georgia would not flip the uh, election to him. And so that is the only reason why the Senate has gone to uh, the Democrats. And had he not done that, without a doubt, the Republicans would have, uh, Brian Kemp would have cheated just like he did when he um, uh, stole the race from Stacey Abrams. And he would have made sure that the two Republicans won. And then, heck, maybe they would have just won outright anyway. There's so much voter suppression and in Georgia. And then you wouldn't have had um, Brown uh, uh, become the Supreme Court justice. It would be an open seat. Uh, so it would be two to six on the Supreme Court instead of six to three or, or uh, three to six. And um, none of these initiatives, nothing that Biden passed, and he certainly hasn't passed much, but even the stuff he passed would have not passed. And so it was all because of Donald Trump. And even now, the Republicans are poised to take back the Senate, but he has these horrific candidates like Herschel Walker in Georgia. I mean, 
talk about finding someone who's almost unelectable, even in a red state. Well, he found that guy and now he's repeating that mistake. Uh, I mean, mistake in kind of an objective political sense uh, in Arizona and a few other states. So Democrats might actually hold on to the Senate for the uh, last two years of uh, Biden's term, which is only because of Donald Trump. And people are not grasping that if not for his interference, Republicans would be sweeping the table right now. And unfortunately, the strategists that push and work with um, our leaders, uh, Biden, Schumer, and uh, Pelosi, are just doing nothing really to respond to the reality that they are only going to be in office for a few more months, um, whether it's 12, 24, 36, but that ultimately they will lose. And they are just as much to blame as the Koch brothers, or I guess there's only one left right now, and uh, the rest of the Republican Party, because the Democrats should be winning, and they're not because we just have very ineffective leaders. I want to now go back to a word you used earlier, which is the word conspiracy. And it's a very loaded word, a very problematic word, and a word that's kind of hard nowadays to have any kind of nuanced discussion about because. For understandable reasons, because you have these ridiculous conspiracy theories out there about like shape-shifting satanic Democrats and dungeons sucking the blood of children and whatnot. So, uh, so what then happens, of course, is intelligent people don't want to be remotely associated with the word. So anything that can even remotely be construed as being conspiracy-ish, people will be like, nope, nope, no, that's, that's conspiracy thinking. But actually, so, and this is going to go back to the novel Stark. One of the plot points is, of course, you have a group of very wealthy and powerful people hatch what is essentially a conspiracy. And as I was reading it, it reminded me of a talk that I once attended in the early 2000s by the late, great Gore Vidal, who is one of my favorite writers. And he actually inspired me to be a writer. And, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, you know, when people hear the word conspiracy, they think of flying saucers and little green men. And even though I'm paraphrasing here, I remember him using that exact phrase, flying saucers and little green men. And then he said, but actually, it's really mundane. It's nothing more than wealthy and powerful people doing what they can to hold on to their wealth and power and to not share it. And another thing Gore Vidal said on a different occasion was, anytime I want to know what the rulers of this country are up to, all I have to do is look into my own cold black heart. <laughs> That's great. I've never, I've never heard that second quote from him. And I, I too am a big fan. I've read almost all of his historical novels, <laughs> which were, were all fantastic. Yeah. As, as well as some of his essays. Yeah, they're terrific. So again, the word conspiracy is very loaded and problematic, but I think Gore Vidal's definition of a conspiracy is, is one that I kind of resonate with and I think actually occurs because again, it's nothing more than wealthy and powerful people wanting more wealth and power yeah. and taking practical steps to ensure yeah. that they can hold on to it. And, yeah. and, and yes, if possible, they want to be subtle and secretive about it because with things like dark money you know, and gerrymandering, because if more people knew exactly what the ultra wealthy are doing, there would be mass you know, outrage. It'd be like an uprising. And that would be very much an inconvenience to the ruling class. So I think they do go about it in subtle ways if possible. So my question is, would you indeed consider what people like the Koch brothers and their fellow billionaires and the ruling class have been systematically doing to, because as you lay out in your book, it's very systematic. I mean, it's almost genius yeah. the way they've done it. Um, yeah, would it you is. consider that to be a kind of conspiracy of sorts? Yeah, I mean, I I think conspiracy is basically just an agreement that you have with other people behind closed doors. And, you know, you can use it as a pejorative, but at the end of the day, conspiracy is just an agreement of people. And, you know, there is a conspiracy to overthrow the British monarch in um, 1776, right? Uh, that's one way to look at it. I guess it just depends on what your values are as to whether you want to call it a conspiracy or an agreement in the dark. 
But I think what Gore Vidal has to say is I think he's identified what I consider and my nonprofit promotes as one of the two political systems in the world. And so we, in a sense, have taken his definition of conspiracy and said, actually, it's not just a conspiracy. There are only two political social systems in the entire world throughout the entire human history. And one of them is what he is talking about, which is another way of saying it, is the consolidation of wealth and power into the hands of the few. And that way of political being, that political philosophy is as prevalent in the United States corporate boards as it is in the Saudi Arabian royal family, as it is in the Chinese Communist Party, um, as it is in the Nicaragua Socialist Sandinistas, as it is in the um, Christian princes of Europe uh, throughout history. It is basically a small group of people who want everything for themselves. And that is one of the of only two political systems we have ever, ever had. And now, if you are born in a Muslim country, then you bring Islam and try to uh, obscure what you're really doing by trying to justify things with the Quran. If you're in a Christian world, you do it through the Bible. If you're in a capitalist world, you do it through, um, uh, you know, appealing to John Locke. If you are in a communist world, then you bring in uh, Marx. But ultimately, it's all the same. And the leaders of Saudi Arabia, today's leaders of Saudi Arabia, of Venezuela under Maduro, um, Nicaragua, Cuba, the United States, they have more in common than uh, with each other than they do with their own people that they rule over. So that's the first political system. And the second political system is democracy or the spreading of the opportunities uh, to succeed in, in a country. And the more you spread the opportunities, the more democracy you have. And that is the antidote to the consolidation. So it's consolidation versus spreading. And some socialist countries spread it, some capitalist countries spread it, some religious countries spread it. But that is the only political, two political systems I recognize. And um, so I think Gore Vidal had it right. I just would go farther. It's not a conspiracy. It's the actual dominant political system throughout human history. Yeah. And speaking of spreading democracy, so just like you, when you were younger and you read Stark, Someone who reads this novel or your book may come away feeling very inspired and determined to take part in any number of various causes, such as climate action, uh, reducing income inequality, racial justice, many other things. But one of the biggest points that you make in your book is that whatever respective causes we may care about, that very little progress will be made on any of them unless we first address the problem of saving and fixing democracy, which is why it is in many ways the most urgent issue, despite the fact that it's probably less talked about on like social media or things like that. So can you tell our listeners why exactly it is the most urgent issue? Yeah. And, and it's not even little progress. There will be no progress, zero progress. And in fact, everything will go backwards, as you're seeing with the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, possibly overturning abortion um, or, or uh, outlying abortion throughout the country, certainly entertaining a court case that would give state legislators, i.e. conservative Republican state legislators, the ability to overturn the popular vote for president in their state and award all the electoral votes to the person of their choosing, which if that pa if the Supreme Court allows that, a Democrat will never be elected again because Republican state legislatures control more than the uh, 270 you need to win the presidency. And the, the list goes on and on and on. We're, we're not making, it's not that we're going to make a little progress, it's that we are going backwards significantly, and that will speed up in the next 10 or 15, 20 years. So hold on to your seats, folks. And uh, unless, of course, we are able to fix democracy, but there's only one issue that we can focus on right now in democracy, only one, and that is fixing the filibuster. Because without fixing the filibuster, nothing else can get done. Nothing. 
There is nothing you could do. You could pass the greatest laws in the world under Nancy Pelosi. You could let AOC write the greatest laws in the world and get them passed by the Democratic House, but they will die in the Senate, period. There is no piece of legislation worth passing other than, ironically, budget ones, right? Like that's where you have to get everything done is the almighty dollar. So you, if you want to spend money on, you know, um, allowing people to buy American-made, uh, environmentally, you know, somewhat more environmentally better cars, well, yeah, there's money for that. If you want to manufacture solar panels, yeah, there's money for that. And so our problem is because we can only get past the filibuster and get past the wall of opposition that corporate America and billionaires have to anything that could increase their taxes and get past the Supreme Court. The only way we can get past those three entities is if we're actually spending money and thus corporations benefit. And of course, billionaires benefit because they hold stocks in many of these companies and industries where the money is going to be going to. And the Supreme Court has no interest in upsetting that mechanism. So they allow that to happen. That's how you get things passed in the United States Senate or in American democracy in 2022. But for the larger issues that don't actually also benefit corporate America, you won't get anything passed without reforming the, the filibuster and the reform I had, and I won't you know, get into all 12 steps of how to save American democracy, but I will say this is, you know, the Democrats, I don't even know if they really want to fix democracy. And there's a, re a number of reasons and proofs I put in the book about that. Um, and I'll just give you one, which is if you were elected in a gerrymandered seat, if your seat was gerrymandered, say in a Republican uh, state, but you still won, and you have a safe seat because they've packed all the Democrats in your seat and they've taken them away from all the other seats um, in the House of Representatives or in the state legislature so that, you know, in nine seats, Republicans win by one percentage. And then in your seat, you win by 50 percent. Are you really going to want to get rid of gerrymandering? Because you have a guaranteed lifetime salary of 175,000 plus you have benefits you we can't even imagine that you get in congress you get parties thrown for you and all types of amazing opportunities financial social and otherwise and you kind of are a king of your little congressional district or a queen will you actually vote to get rid of gerrymandering because the democrats could they could get rid of all gerrymandering nationwide with one vote, well, two, because you need it in the Senate, but they don't. And so I don't think the Democrats, as they are currently constructed, would save democracy. But the whole idea with the filibuster reform is that you don't get rid of the filibuster. Filibuster serves a good purpose. It lets the opposition, the minority, be able to say to the American public, hey, the majority is doing something horrible and we're trying to stop it. But they shouldn't have veto power, that that is where it becomes undemocratic. It should just delay any passage of legislation and delay it by you know two weeks. There's enough media attention, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TV, what have you, that you should be able to rile up um, your uh, the public to stop and demand the stoppage of some piece of legislation. But ultimately, the majority should rule. That's really the definition of democracy. But no one talks about reforming the filibuster. The Democrats are, you know, 48 of them are, we want to get rid of, we want to get rid of the filibuster, which is an untenable position. And they know that. They know they can't get the 49th and 50th vote. So they are, it's just like the House passing um, legislation to protect abortion. They know it's not going to withstand the Senate filibuster. They know the Supreme Court will strike it down. But they do it anyway. And as soon as they do it, they send out an email asking for money. And that's the game. So even though you know your actions won't have any effect whatsoever, you do them anyway. You promote them in, amongst your most loyal people and you get money from those people for doing an action that has absolutely no effect on the American political um, environment. And that's what Democrats have been doing for decades now, literally decades. and. That is why I don't think the Democrats are going to be able to save democracy because they're not actually doing the things that it takes to save democracy. 
Okay, we've just established why the issue of saving democracy is the most important issue in terms of making true and lasting progress with the major issues that people care about. But now I want to talk about different ways to try and do that or to try to achieve that. And for much of your life, you have tried to fight for democracy through electoral politics by being an activist, a political strategist, commentator, and even at one point, a congressional candidate. But now you're in the process of a transition in which you are taking the time and energy you used to put into politics into something else. And that something else is a nonprofit organization called Five Journeys, which, as I understand it, is undergoing a name change. But for now, we'll just call it Five Journeys. And I'm going to let you tell the audience what it's about. But I do want to ask you to also explain something that you've told me about before, which is that. Fighting for democracy is still one of your objectives. It's just that you're going about it in a different way now. And, and so could you tell us about Five Journeys in general, but also could you specifically explain how you are going about your activism through a different means now yeah. at this point in your life? Uh, I would analyze all my previous decades of work in politics as basically having not pushed our society even one inch uh, forward. And at this point, the only rationale to be involved in electoral politics is to stop the decline. It is to stop the Republicans uh, from being able to take over in such a thorough manner that they have no opposition in their drive to, uh, in essence, destroy the earth to make profit, to fracture society so that the wealth can consolidate even further into the hands of the few. And so if you want to get involved in politics today, it's basically to stop a negative from happening. And, and really, to be frank, it's to slow down the negative from happening because there's absolutely no way to stop the negative from happening, given our current state of the opposition of the Democrats. So I am no longer supporting Democrats. I fight against Republicans, but I don't support Democrats anymore. And sometimes that there's really, you can't really distinguish between the two because it's a two-party state and I'm not going to um, waste a vote for a party that has no possibility in this current structure, which is another reason why our structure doesn't work. The fact that we can't have a moderate party in between the two and we can't have a purely left-wing party and we can't have a right-wing party that stops pretending that it cares about democracy um, and just kind of let, let their fascist flag fly in public. And I think, which would be a good thing. It would actually probably help Republicans gain some rationality again if you had a far right party that um, uh, stopped uh, working with the Republicans. But um, I am much more interested in the long game at this point. I've worked in politics for 30 years in one capacity or the other, and I don't see any possibility of progress. And 2008 was really the last time I had any hope. And we saw that given the Democrats' inability to either understand what was happening at the time or effectively marshal a strategy and their resources to fight it, they completely squandered the amazing opportunity they had in 2008. It is probably shocking for people to remember that when Obama had his absolute landslide in November of 2008, the Democrats had 60 seats in the Senate, 60-40. It was filibuster proof at that point, and they had almost two-thirds in the House. Yet nothing happened under eight years of Obama. We had a milk toast um, health care reform that was really, as Obama repeated, about a thousand times ad nauseum, was a Republican think tank plan to begin with. So basically, Obama and under eight years, set a slightly different tone that didn't really matter. As you can see, we had Trump afterwards, so you can't say that tone changed anything. Uh, and we got a Republican think tank healthcare system. That's it. And that was because of how ineffective Democrats are in their particular leadership. So I'm interested in the long game. There is no solution um, in 2022, 2024, 2026. There's not going to be a Obama with a amazingly strategic majority coming in to actually affect change in the short term. And you can't really rely on that anyway. So instead, you need to, I think, better educate people, but 
really more importantly, you need to have a transformation in people. And that's what's been lacking on the left for a long time. We've abandoned religion uh, on the whole. There are certainly some Christians and some Muslims and some Hindus and Buddhists in the Democrat camp, but I wouldn't call it a movement other, say, other than, say, in the Black church. But on the whole, Democrats are not undergoing spiritual transformation. And um, they're just we're just kind of angry right now. And for good reasons. I'm angry. I'm as angry as anyone else is. Just read my book. Despite some of the humor in it, it was written um, <laughs> mostly when I was in an angry mood. But anger is not enough. Anger doesn't transform people. It doesn't transform yourself, and it doesn't transform those around you, and it certainly doesn't transform society, at least not in any positive manner. Republicans are now using that falsified anger of the election being stolen and the latest, of course, that Trump was targeted as a political candidate by the FBI going to Mar-a-Lago, his home estate, to rummage through his stuff uh, is, is how they're putting it. So they are using anger now, but that's just not enough. It might be enough for tearing things down, but it's not enough to build things. And that's what we need to do. And so five journeys, which might be called three journeys soon, is um, a path to transform people. And we talk about three journeys that people are are undergoing. Every single person on earth has a journey that they take with themselves throughout their life. They have a journey that they take with those around them. And then they have a journey uh, with all of creation. And so we are looking at those three journeys. Each kind of has two parts to it. And each of those subparts, um, we have eight steps eight steps that move us along these three journeys toward a more important connection with each other, something we call the great connection. And that is, for some, very spiritual. It's that impetus to love each other, to love one another, to help one another, to educate one another, to root for the underdog, to go into burning buildings, to save a complete stranger, to, you know, be a nurse or a doctor for 60 hours a week during a pandemic and not be able to see your family. It's to educate young children well past your retirement age because it's so important and you love it so much. You know, it's creating art, it's creating drama, it is creating and making things for people to ease the burdens in their lives. Life. It is all of this caretaking we do for each other, and we call it the great connection. It is what binds us all together. And so the path we see is one toward moving people to recognize that great connection, to understand that it is powerful, it is transformative, and that it is probably the single greatest threat to the political system that seeks to consolidate wealth and power, whether that's a capitalistic political system or a socialist or communist political system or a fascist political system or a religious system like in Saudi Arabia and, and Christian nationalism that people are trying to bring here in the U.S. or ultra-orthodoxy in, um, in Israel or India, right? There, you have all of these different supposedly disparate political systems, communism, socialism, capitalism, the Saudi family, the uh, Russian oligarchs, but it's all the exact same thing. It's all seeking to consolidate wealth and power into the hands of the few. So what is the antidote to that? Politically, it is simply democracy, and that is de democratizing opportunities for everyone. But there's got to be something more than just that. And that's where the great connection comes in. It is part and parcel of the reason why we want to democratize things, right? Because we actually believe in each other. We are connected to each other, and that is why democracy is the choice for people who believe in humanity and our ability to move forward and make a greater world for all of us. And so that is what Three Journeys seeks to do and help you along those paths. And it can be very political. You know, the third journey, the journey with all of creation, that's two parts. One is the great connection, but then the other part is creating a common good world. And that is understanding the roots of racism and sexism and xenophobia and our treatment of children, our treatment of um, uh, seniors, the way we trash the environment. Those are all in there as well, which are you know, generally thought of as political issues. And we try to show that they're, it's beyond just politics. This is about individuals and groups who are trying to interfere with our ability to connect with each other and to connect with all of creation. And they do so 
out of profit motive. They do so to consolidate wealth and power. And it's not just profit in the sense of, you know, socialist countries don't necessarily have a profit motive, but they certainly have a motive to consolidate wealth and power in their hands. Just look at the Communist Chinese, uh, the Chinese Communist Party or the Politburo of the old Soviet Union. You couldn't find more powerful people. They made the U.S. senators seem weak in comparison. They consolidated power for themselves, and they did so at the expense of our connection with each other and with all of the earth. And so we have to go back to basics to try to make people aware that this great connection is available to them, and it will transform their lives. It'll transform their politics. It'll transform their spirituality, and ultimately, it will transform the world. And is that a solution for the next election cycle? No. Is it a solution for any of the next uh, few upcoming election cycles? No. You might still need to oppose, you know, Sean Hannity from becoming president or Tucker Carlson or uh, DeSantis or, God forbid, Trump again. But just understand that that is limited when you do that. You are fighting against something. You are not transforming society. And we hope we are creating a path together that can actually do that transformation that we so desperately need, even if it's not just in a two-year time period. Yeah, and one of the reasons, and there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why what you're saying really resonates with me personally is that I believe that without an internal transformation of values, and maybe not universally across society, because I don't know that that's ever possible, but at least among a more significant cross-section of society, without that kind of internal transformation of values, and we can call it spiritual, but some people might not like that word. So just, you know, we just say it's about values. That without that, that even if we were somehow able to miraculously save democracy, the eventually the wealthy and powerful would be able to manipulate that system to once again benefit their needs, just like they've been able to do. So I feel like without a widespread transformation of our values, that corruption would just over time become inevitable again. And that that's why we need this kind of intersections between spirituality, um, you know, a non-dogmatic form of spirituality, or for some people dogmatic, whatever, as long as it's harmonious. And having that coincide with political activism and engagement, because otherwise I feel like it's so easy to, to get lost and kind of forget why you're doing all this and to get corrupted by, by power, essentially. Yeah, agreed. So imagine that someone listening to you speak right now were to come up to you and ask, okay, Haven, so I understand that you're going through this kind of uh, change of approach of sorts. And I'm someone, I'm being this hypothetical person asking you a question. I'm someone who cares about democracy, but all I really know how to do is vote, you know, help campaign for my favorite candidates. Sometimes I protest. I try to, you know, spread the message on social media. So I do what I can, but I don't really have the resources to start my own organization or anything like that. Like, this is all I know how to do, just conventional participation and engagement in politics. Is this, am I going about it the wrong way? Should I be doing something differently? Like, how would you answer somebody asking you that question? Yeah, I think, um, I don't want to judge anybody's efforts because anybody who is working hard to stop autocrats like Trump and the Republican Party is doing very, very important work. Ultimately, as long as they understand that that is just the beginning, that is just the minimum, because if they're not working on themselves, if they're not working to try to help those around them, if they're not trying to work on society and help a transformation at a much greater level than just who's elected and who has the most seats in the house, etc., uh, if they don't understand that, then they're just going to be always disappointed, and eventually they're going to uh, become so jaded they give up. And so, you know, that's our problem with just doing politics. They don't have, you don't have enough answers. And when we finally do get a majority, like we did in 2020 or we did in 2008, which a much greater majority, 
then it's nothing but disappointment because you still have the same structure. And why do we have the same structure, even though you know it's a structure that benefits Republicans, but every once in a while Democrats uh, win because of how incompetent Republicans are, and uh, you know, like the Trump administration and the George Bush administration before Obama. Remember. Biden and Obama only won after 12 years of incredible incompetence from the Republicans. And so what happens when you actually have a competent autocrat? How many years would Republicans stay in power then? And I don't know if DeSantis is that competent Republican, but it seems pretty darn competent to me just in terms of getting stuff done. Not that what he's doing is is correct, but he gets things done and he explains it very well. And that's not something that Democrats have faced in a Republican probably since George Bush Sr. And he didn't explain things well, so he only got one term for it. Nixon was probably the last best Republican for that and arguably Reagan. So uh, ultimately, I think um, people need to understand that fighting against Republicans won't move our society forward. It might help us from backsliding quickly, and so thus it is important work, but you have to go further than that. You have to work on yourself, you have to work on those around you, and you have to work on society, and that's what the Three Journeys platform does, and we actually do our work in teams, so it's not you. It's not like this self-help thing where you read a book and you transform yourself. You are working with a group of people in order to move forward together, and that is critical. Because if we don't build that community, we're not going to have the resilience to be able to stay in this battle and fight against the forces uh, that are aligned uh, against us and against the world. Now imagine a different kind of person coming up to you and asking a different question. So this person would be from, let's say, the collapse aware community. And this person asks, okay, so I hear you talking about the long game. And I hear you mentioning that like the next few election cycles and whatnot, I don't even think we have that kind of time. And they're obviously referencing collapse or their views about collapse. So if someone were to come to you with that, how would you talk to them about what you're doing and your organization and how part of it does involve a long-term kind of resilience building? It, It does do things that in some ways kind of would help prepare communities become more resilient for the, let's say, the climate-related disruptions that lie ahead. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, in fact, we are we might be one of the most, uh, have the most effective programs for those who are collapse-aware and understand that things are going to go even further south, not just politically, but the after-effects of the politics, right? So, you know, imagine Republicans gain complete control of our government again. Well, they're going to stop fighting against global climate change. They're going to loosen up the rules that will actually speed up global climate change. They'll create more food insecurity in places that will destabilize um, nations next door to us, which will mean greater immigration crises um, and more resources spent fighting off these waves of immigrants that we are absolutely going to have in, at our shores and our uh, border in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And so things will start deteriorating. I mean, we can see that in some of the big cities right now when we have 50,000 people homeless every night in tents in Los Angeles. That is the beginning of collapse when you can't really you know, solve simple things with our corporate structure because you can't get a human on the phone, even though you are a, you know, you have money in a bank or you are paying money monthly for a service and they don't even care at all or have the resources to um, troubleshoot your problems. That's another sign of collapse. Uh, Things are so complicated right now for the average human that there's almost nothing we could do to stop money from being taken us taken from us on a monthly basis because we just have to do that in order to survive now if whether it's renting our house or you know the new model of renting cars and not even owning cars all of that is impoverishing the average person and as the average person gets impoverished that means the richest have more wealth 
And when the riches have more wealth, they have more political power. And when they have more political power, they make sure that their wealth is not touched. So there's less taxes overall. And when you have less taxes, that means you don't have the money to address the ills of society. That's why we have homelessness. Like that's the perfect cycle to explain why we have homelessness. As you can hear, I have kids in the background, so I believe in the future. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had them. And ultimately, though, that future might look a lot different than what it looks like to us today. But remember, you know, for the collapse of where there have been countries in collapse for a decade or more now. I mean, you look at Somalia and some other countries, they have been in full flung collapse for uh, longer than my teenage daughter has been alive, let alone my other other kids. And so ultimately what we need to realize is our lives will change. Things will get more difficult. Governments and our corporate benefactors, um, our, uh, uh, the corporations we pay money to, will be less responsive. They will help us less. We'll be more on our own. And there'll be more people who fail in this type of world. And they go from barely being able to make it in a low rent apartment to being on the street. So that is where you can see collapse first and foremost is in people um, basically just not being able to survive in the society and, and moving towards homelessness. So what is three journeys? Well, one of the, probably the fifth project we are working on is creating a regenerative, technically we call it restorative agricultural farm. It's on a nine uh, acre parcel, but we're only devoting about half of it to agriculture. The rest is um, uh, in woodlands and native plants. And um, this farm is creating partnerships uh, with different institutions um, in the community and different groups um, from you know, these are may not be known to all your audience, but Pepperdine University, Malibu Foundation, Growing Hope Gardens, um, LA Compost, and uh, our preschool, um, uh, Better World Learning Pod. And so we are creating these partnerships so that we're able to grow this food on our land in a manner that actually converts this hardened soil, this, it was not even soil, it's just dirt, this compacted clay dirt that was compacted from sun shining on it for 70 years uninterrupted because the previous owners clear cut this land for that long. So you have dirt that is almost akin to concrete that will not absorb water, that has no microbial life, that is doing nothing to sequester carbon um, or be, be a carbon sponge. And we're converting that and we're reversing all of that so that water stays into the soil so that the microbial life is reborn in the soil so that the carbon sequestration cycle occurs along with the transpiration cycle of um, plant and particularly trees because we focus on perennials like trees where they are transpiring water into the air. That's how 40% of all terrestrial rain occurs is through molecules going over forests and other plant life and binding with the nuclei and creating rain. And so this transpiration cycle is as important as the carbon sequestration cycle. So we are replanting this area and we're opening it to the community through partnerships because it's more than my family needs and grow and, and can want and it's more than my family can do. And then uh, we're not just doing that, but we are trying to show people how you can have a career in saving the world. Literally, that can be on your business card and you don't have to be hired by Greenpeace or some other uh, NGO or activist group, but you can do it on your own. Get with a few friends, you buy three to five acres of land on the outskirts of a city, putting 10 to 20% down, which you should do uh, by picking up a couple extra shifts, uh, working for um, you know Uber or something. And you get that land and through the partnerships, and through what we teach, you can have within a year or two, nine different income streams occurring on that property that can sustain you, your family, your community of friends who are part of this. And, you know, and all of these nine income streams all work toward helping the farm thrive. So it's not just the selling of the food and we pick perennials uh, because 
you know, I'm a, at the end of the day, a, a lazy farmer and I want to plant a tree once instead of a tomato bush a hundred times every single year. And so I, um, we're doing a lot of stone fruits and we're doing a lot of um, nuts and then the understory uh, that covers the rest of the soil to increase the microbial life and to serve certain roles to help that tree grow and, and in fact themselves produce food and medicines. And so each of the income streams helps the farm. So we'll have a vermiculture income stream, which is about worms. Worm castings are incredibly valuable as our worms being sold by the pound and they're great for your farm. We have things uh, like compost that we could sell. A biocomplete compost goes for a lot of money and we get all of the materials free. Either we're producing them on the farm or we work in partnerships with landscapers and ranchers who are trying to get rid of manure, trying to get rid of landscape clippings. Uh, neighbors who have food or are more than happy to do no donate their food. All of that's put together in a compost and that helps the soil. And then uh, there's you know other income streams from uh, cultivating mushrooms, which is incredibly important for, for any type of uh, planting, particularly tree to have that type of fungi network in your soil. Oil, but you can also grow expensive mushrooms where the fruit part, uh, which is a part above the ground, can be picked without killing the fungi network underneath it and sold to restaurants um, or to consumers at a high price because they're organic and they're locally grown. And then we have the uh, preschool pod where we take a Reggio Emilia approach which I won't get into now, but it's basically project-based learning for children. And you have that on your pod and they can have a forest and farm curriculum mixed in with the Reggio Emilia and parents are coming to give their children that experience, which is also another income source for you. And you can do it under a nonprofit system. You can do it under a B Corp, uh, which is kind of a cross between a for-profit and it's still for-profit, but it's a cross between a C corporation and a nonprofit, or you could just do a C corp because you're still doing good work. So we're sure Showing how this can be done, we can transform, in essence, concrete and asphalt, um, although it's really just compact dirt, and make it a something that um, helps turn the tide on global climate change while producing the organic food, while building community, and while giving you just an incredibly interesting and amazing life. I've, you know, I've. I built my own immigration law firm, a very successful one. I had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of clients, eight employees. Uh, I ran a big union of 5,000 members, but this is without a doubt the most interesting, complex, difficult, and fun work I've ever done. And that's just part of what Three Journeys does because we're building the curriculum that we've talked about previously. But, um, but that's one of our projects. And, you know, talk about being collapse ready. Well, wouldn't it be good for you to have a source of growing your own food in community with others? If you believe collapse is going to happen, you know, you can only store so many cans um, in your bunker. Uh, you need to actually be able to need to grow stuff. And yeah, can growing be difficult in cold places and hot places? Yes. But our system where we follow the Mark Shepherds of the world, we follow the Zach Weisses of the world, the Elaine Ingram, that system we're putting in place that can be duplicated is really drought proof and cold proof and is just the absolute best way to have a farm thrive without having to buy the seeds, without having to buy the fertilizer, the nitrogen, the tractors, all these things that make our conventional farmers in debt from day one and keeps them in debt and basically makes them in voluntary servitude or uh, involuntary servants on their own land. And so, or serfs as they used to call it um, in Russia. So we are changing that for people and yeah, I think it's great for those who are collapse aware to start this now. You don't need to uh, wait because your job at Starbucks or your job as a stockbroker is not going to help you if you understand collapse is about to occur. Whereas what you, we're building here does help you. That all sounds terrific. I'm going to, for these last couple of questions, I'm going to bring us back to the novel that we started this discussion with. So Ben Elton Stark and kind of try to tie everything together. And this next question is going to be a bit of a philosophical question. And so there's no way to ask this question and get to the philosophy of it without 
a spoiler. So I'm going to go ahead and say <laughs> that if you do plan to read Stark, and I mean seriously plan to read it, because if you're not yeah. going to be honest with yourself, if you're not going to read it, then you, you oh, got to really read it in question. You got to read it. Read it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just because it. it's so fun. Like all this stuff we're talking about is so heavy, Daniel, but that is so fun. It's such a beautiful book and it is a great way to introduce yourself to what's happening. And if you already know what's happening, it's a great book to pass off to someone who doesn't know what's happening. And, you know, it's just, it's a fantastic read, even 30 years later after it was written. Okay. So I totally second that. So, so let me, let me amend what I just said. So since you are going to read Stark, <laughs> everyone, this next question will contain a spoiler, so it's up to you whether you want to listen to the rest of it or not. You might want to skip ahead like five or ten minutes and then come back and listen again once you've finished reading Star, because you're definitely going to want to hear this question and hopefully Haven's answer after you've finished reading it. But this philosophical question that I want to ask is, in the novel, you have this team of eco-activists. I think they were called the Eco-Action Group or something like that. and I, they do everything they can, this group of activists, to try to fight against the corporate overlords, the billionaires, and to try and prevent what the billionaires are trying to do. And to try to prevent, um, well, they can't really prevent the collapse, but they're trying to, I think, uh, foil the plans of the billionaires. And here's the big spoiler. Ultimately, they lose, right? Despite their noble efforts, they lose. You know, you have talked about the previous ways that you have engaged with uh, electoral politics in a more conventional way. Now you're talking about what you're doing with five journeys or three journeys, as it may soon be called. So those are both direct and indirect ways of fighting, in a sense, fighting corruption and the handful of the powerful and wealthy who are trying to consolidate power. But this kind of philosophical point that the novel Stark seems to make is that Unless you have the kind of resources that the billionaires have, you're sort of doomed to lose. And looking at it from the long term, the big picture, do you think that we, we regular people who care and who want to make a difference and want to create lasting change, that we ever really stand a chance, like regardless of how we're going about it, it could be through conventional electoral politics, could be through organizations like Three Journeys, whatever we're doing, if we're trying to fight against selfishness, against greed, do we ever stand a chance against the minority of powerful and wealthy people who continue to want to uh, manipulate the system towards their own interests? Um, <laughs> well, uh, that's a tough question because the pragmatic answer is one that is very difficult to both say and to hear. Our society has shown uh, that in our less than 10,000 years of community, um, uh, well, I should say of living in cities and nation states and empires, the rich have always won. Um, and they've always been able to consolidate wealth and power into their own hands. And other than some brief experiments of democracy, and, and believe me when I say 99% of the humans who have lived on this earth have lived under autocrats, not in a democracy, then uh, yeah, it's kind of depressing to think that and difficult to imagine that we could actually defeat that system. But every once in a while, there are movements that are huge and great, and these movements can transform society. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, looking in our rear view mirror, it doesn't look very hopeful necessarily, but I am one who really believes in both the resilience, the imagination, and the transformative power uh, within humanity. And I am just trying to do my small part in helping kind of keep that flame alive and create structures for that type of energy to thrive and uh, transform individuals and society. And, uh, you know, only time will tell if my efforts are 
uh, going to be effective or not. But, you know, I put my efforts up against almost anybody's because no one is being very effective at this moment. Um, you know, Martin Luther King was the, one of the last people that was truly effective. Um, but, you know, there obviously have been others. And so I think um, we just have to keep believing in ourselves. We are in this together, even though there's a few of us who really don't see themselves as part of us. They see themselves as, in essence, the elite, right? The elite who should control things in, in society, whether that is the Chinese Communist Party who believes that in China or the aristocracy in the United States um, uh, made up of billionaires and corporate elite who believe that here or the oligarchs of Russia or the Saad family in Saudi Arabia. Every society has that elite and they have so much more in common with each other than they do with us. But we are the vast majority. We are really the 99% as, as that great slogan from just a few years ago pointed out. And it's only a matter of time before we uh, are able to see that connection with each other and create a new system based on that. And it's not like some radical, you know, idealistic utopian thing. I'm not talking about like, oh, every night we gather together at our respective kitchen tables and jointly communally make decisions affecting the entire world all at once. You know, I, I, this has nothing to do with those kind of fantasies of utopia. This is just the pragmatic of, hey, the more democracy, the better. The more people have opportunities to uh, create in a society, to speak out in a society, to build things, to change things, the better that society will be. That's what it just comes down to. It's believing in each other, believing in humanity, and that together we can create amazing things. Whether it's a vaccine that we get out of almost nowhere for a, a disease that also seems like it came out of nowhere, whether it came out of a Chinese lab or came from a turtle soup that somebody ate, you know, it doesn't really matter. The fact is people got together and they were able to fight against it and save millions of lives because of it. That is the great connection. Every scientist who worked on that, every bureaucrat who tried to make that happen um, uh, logistically, every single doctor and nurse who administered those shots saved people's lives. Everybody who wore masks, that is the great connection. And now we just have to understand the power of that. And that's the movement that I am looking to be part of. And um, I am hoping that we can provide a intellectual framework for it or a spiritual impetus for it or you know whatever we have some small role in making that happen because i don't see a, anything else that can rise to this occasion that's out there but the good news is there might be a thousand other people doing this exact type of thing and they may get ahead of us and their program might work better and then i get to join their program and i don't have to worry about all the logistics of this uh, on my own that would be fantastic or maybe we all join together and we create something even different than any of us have currently in mind but ultimately i believe in that power of humanity unfortunately just be completely harsh about it. I think there'll be a few billion people who die in the next 20 or 30 years because we didn't address global climate change, because we didn't address the um, absolute despoilation of our forests and of our agricultural soil. There will be wars, there will be famine, there'll be diseases that go unchecked, there will be mass poverty. Uh, I think there's a lot of bad things that are going to be happening. And uh, you just have to kind of look in the long term term frame of it that there's a lot of bad things that happened in the last 10,000 years and of recorded history or really 6,000 years of, of semi-recorded history and probably a lot of bad stuff that happened in the last 100,000 years. I'm sure when groups of um, homo sapiens met their Neanderthal partners, it wasn't all um, uh, dancing and singing kumbaya. There was probably genocide that occurred against um, other humanoids. So, you know, we've lived with that. We've survived that. We have some of that you know, in essence, we have the genocide against the poor that's going to be happening in the next 30, 40, 50 years. And those poor in the poorest nations and it's the poor in our own country. That will occur. There's nothing that will stop that at this point. We just have to figure out how to lessen it, how to slow it down and how to speed up the reversal of it. But there will be people who suffer no matter what we do right now. And as horrible as that is, 
that can't stop us because that's always been the case. And that is part of the human plight. That is part of the challenge we have. And whether you want to call it the devil, uh, which is some who in the religious community might say, or incompetence, as the Chinese Communist Party might say, or whatever, it, it is with us. It will continue happening. And uh, But ultimately, it's not reason to give up hope or to stop uh, working against it or stop trying to transform ourselves and society. If anything, it gives us even greater reason because even if three or four or God forbid, five or six billion people die in the next 50 years unnecessarily, it could be worse. So let's change our society together, but we have to start with ourselves. And that's why, you know, three journeys, our tagline is better life, better world, because we need a better life for ourselves in order to have a better world. But it can't just stop at the better life. We have to have in our consciousness and as our motivation to create a better world. Just very quickly, just for fun, who is your favorite character in Stark and why? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, CD is probably my favorite character. Um, the man who just uh, suffered from the unrequited love. I, I kind of forget what his age is in the book, probably early 20s. And certainly in my teenage years, I too suffered from unrequited love. And so I uh, have a great sympathy toward him and his awkwardness of trying to fit in and be cool and be a leader when he, have, he has none of those uh, skills or abilities. I think I had some of that awkwardness in my youth as well. But at the end of the day, you know he's got a good heart. And even though he doesn't have a shot to get the girl or to save the world, he's still trying. He's still showing up at every moment. And there's got to be something there to admire that. Then, um, uh, yeah, so probably CD is my favorite character. Yeah, my oh, yours. Zimmerman. Oh, yeah, I'm mine's Zimmerman. It's classic. <laughs> Absolutely Zimmerman. Yeah, because he's <laughs> funny as hell. He's a real yeah. badass, right? He's got those combat skills. He's got those funny lines. Some of his the funniest lines were from Zimmerman for me. Absolutely. And he's he was proof that you don't need balls to have balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I have read and reread that one scene of Zimmerman and, and the truckers. It is because it's just one of the most classic scenes in all of literature. It is just hilarious and so well written. And I just, I just love that underdog uh, sentimentality that was put in there. Uh, and uh, I won't give any more of that away, but it is one of my favorite parts of the book for sure. Okay. So now, uh, would you like to tell the audience where they can find more information about your book? And also they can get more info about uh, five journeys or three journeys rather. Sure. The book is on, you know, any avail, uh, any major bookseller. Uh, you can get it uh, through Audible. Uh, you can get it onto a Kindle or a Google type reader and you can buy a hard co copy or a um, paperback. So it's about every format you could wish for. And uh, it's just called last chance to save American democracy. And it is as relevant today as it was when I wrote it two years ago. And in fact, if anything, it's aged better because uh, or aged very well because all the things I predicted have come true, uh, which gives it, I think, a lot of um, authenticity and authority uh, because every single solution we have in that book uh, has not been done and remains the only solutions that will help our democracy. And um, they're going to be as relevant tomorrow in two years and four years as they are today or two years ago. And so that's one place. And then our website, which is undergoing changes as, as always, um, is currently fivejourneys.org. That's the number five. And even if we do change our name, rebrand a little bit, will that always be a place that will forward to the most uh, current view? Uh, so that's five, the number five and then the word journeys.org. And, um, and then our preschool, if you're in um, the Topanga area, is uh, betterworldpod.org. Uh, and our farm is in Tuna Canyon, which is in Topanga. And we have visitors coming up every single week so uh, and volunteers. And we kind of have a co-op model that when you work, you get a portion of the uh, eventual food that we are producing. And so it's a co-op model in that sense, as is the preschool. Sounds like a good deal. 
All right. And I'll include all those links in the show notes. And thanks so much, Haven, for taking the time to talk with us today about the novel Stark, about your book and your organization and all the good work that you do. Uh, You're welcome. Thanks for the very excellent questions, Daniel. Really enjoyed the interview. And that wraps up my interview with Haven Scott McGarish. At the very least, I hope it inspires you to read the novel Stark by Ben Elton, or Haven's own book, Last Chance to Save American Democracy, or ideally both. But even better, I hope that it gets people thinking about the connections between democracy on one hand and collapse on the other, and how when you have a plutocracy, government by and for the wealthy, then collapse basically becomes an inevitable outcome. And Haven has talked about several different ways that each of us can play a part in helping to preserve and rejuvenate democracy and to fight against plutocracy or autocracy. And I hope that you'll feel inspired to either begin or to continue your own fight to preserve democracy and build community resilience in whatever ways that you feel inclined to do so. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, I am the pop mythologist. And this is the end. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Please subscribe. And if you're willing, share one of these episodes on social media. And if your chosen podcast platform allows reviews, like Apple Podcasts, I invite you to leave a review as well. Thank you.